Um, just going to go ahead and kick things off uh, for starters. Um, uh, welcome to Purdue University's Bowman Testing Lab. Um, it's kind of a, uh, we, we chose this because of the rain, uh, otherwise we probably would have been out on I-65 and we hope to do that at some point in the future. Um, but uh, it's, it's kind of convenient that we're here. This is the structural testing lab for Purdue University. Um, it's an important part of NDOT's joint partnership with Purdue through our joint transportation research program. Uh, there's also the Center for Aging Infrastructure, which is focused on steel bridges down the road from here. And then our research program that I mentioned before is, is headquartered here in West Lafayette. So um, we have a, a strong partnership where we work together to solve uh, the variety of transportation issues that we face. Uh, it started off uh, 100 years ago when we were trying to build the first roads here, here in Indiana, and that research uh, has continued and evolved today to uh, preserving and maintaining our existing roads and bridges and finding innovative ways to do that, to have products that last longer, that provide increased safety. So those of you that drove uh, 231 north here uh, would have seen the rumble stripes in the middle and on the sides of the road on 231. That's an example of, of one of the innovations that's uh, part of the, uh, the work that we're doing here with Purdue and West Lafayette. Uh, but the reason we're here today is to talk about the closure of the I-65 northbound bridge uh, over Wildcat Creek, which is near Lafayette between uh, State Road 26 and State Road 25. Uh, the way this is uh, structured today is we're going to have our commissioner, Brandy Hendrickson, uh, say a few words. And then as uh, you saw his name on the, uh, the media advisory, uh, our bridge design engineer, uh, Jeremy Hunter, will also say a few words, give the sort of timeline of what's been accomplished to date, uh, how we got to where we are today. Um, this is part of our commitment to uh, continuing to keep the public informed as we go through this and work to reopen the bridge safely and as quickly as possible. Um, so we've been putting out a lot of information over the weekend, but since this happened uh, at Friday afternoon, uh, we wanted to regroup and make sure that we had all the information that we were making that available to everyone. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, our Commissioner, Brandy Hendrickson, to say a few words. Thank you. Yeah, come on over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, again, my name is Brandi Hendrickson and I'm the uh, INDOT's Commissioner. <laughs> uh, first, I just want to um, express uh, um, an appreciation to the motoring public for their patience. Um, under normal circumstances, road construction is a challenge. Uh, but the full closure of a major interstate um, is understandably frustrating and um, certainly difficult to bear. So just want to put that out there first that we do recognize this as, as uh, a challenge. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, brief Governor Pence this morning again. Uh, he shares NDOT's view that safety is the number one priority and supports our decision to take action before the public uh, was put in harm's way or that the bridge sustained any long-term damage. It's very important uh, that we took action uh, to pre prevent those things from happening. That decision was based on close monitoring that showed movement of one of the bridge piers. Our initial assessment indicates that soil conditions in the area specific to this location and construction activities uh, taking place, uh, those are the things that caused that movement. We're currently awaiting results of geotechnical analysis to determine viable solutions. And only after those um, solutions are identified will we be able to give an estimated timeline uh, for solutions or reopening. Governor Pence has asked for us to consider creative solutions uh, and different options for getting the bridge open as quickly and as safely as possible. Meanwhile, uh, we're continuing to monitor detour routes for congestion and adjusting signal timings as necessary to help facilitate mobility. The good news is that uh, traffic along detour routes appears to be adjusting to the changes and recent improvements along other state routes um, are helping too. 
I do want to uh, call attention to the fact that um, we've experienced excellent response and cooperation from Indiana State Police, Federal Highway Administration, city officials in Lafayette and West Lafayette, and we are certainly grateful for technical assistance from Purdue University. We are committed to keeping the public informed of our repair plans and estimated reopening date. Um, the public can help by sharing um, our tweets and also updates from NDOT's Facebook pages. Now I would like to turn it over to Jeremy Hunter, our uh, bridge design manager, who can share some technical information. So to share the, uh, the timeline of events of, of what occurred uh, Friday, uh, we, we received a phone call from the contractor who had been monitoring the bridge very closely. He noticed uh, some unusual movements uh, at, at uh, bridge pier number three for the northbound bridge. At that time, we were, we were concerned uh, about the movements, and so we ordered traffic off of the bridge. Uh, immediately after that event, NDOT, Bridge engineers met on site with the contractor as well as with uh, several geotechnical or soils experts to, to evaluate the site, uh, to discuss um, what might have happened, and, and also to discuss any potential solutions. And we proceeded from there. On Saturday morning, we scheduled a, a, a conference at the site with uh, a specially geotechnical consultant that had been hired by the contractor to come in and, and evaluate the conditions. Uh, the specialty consultant uh, requested uh, additional testing um, so that they could evaluate the site and be sure that whatever solution is proposed is, is the right solution and, and the safe solution. The, the testing began on Sunday. Uh, the, the soils engineers began um, getting the tests around the foundation. And that, that testing, uh, as, as I understand it, is still ongoing. They are getting soil samples and uh, finding out um, exactly what is going on around the foundation of, of the pier in question. And we are waiting for the results of those tests, uh, and then we are also waiting for, for the analysis and the recommendations by, by the uh, soils experts uh, before we make a decision about the appropriate course of action to ensure that we can safely open the bridge. Uh, we are also working with uh, Purdue University to uh, install some real-time monitoring for the bridge for all of the piers uh, so that we can we can ensure that we know that if if there are any movements anything of concern that that we will know immediately and and be able to to keep the bridge safe. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so that uh, concludes the formal part of our briefing. Uh, at this point, we wanted to open it up to questions. Um, we'll try to be uh, structured in the way that we do that. So who would like to go first? Uh, Kara, I saw your hand first. Oh, man. So um, obviously, the inspection reports show that there were structural issues with this bridge dating several years back. When did INDOT become aware that there were some structural issues with this bridge and what was sort of the, the plan of attack? When did all that start to come to fruition? Sure. So the, the construction project that we're building today was intended to address the structural issues that were identified in the inspections. Um, the construction also brought about what we're dealing with right now. So um, we're working through that. Um, this is. Uh, uh, clear uh, of the challenges that uh, that we face with rehabilitating and, and maintaining existing highways and interstates um, that we're working right alongside traffic that's moving at high speeds uh, trying to maintain that traffic on the old bridge while we build the new. Um, so that's uh, one of the challenges that we face but uh, again those issues that were identified um, were translated into specific actions that were part of the contract that's underway. So uh, installing um, uh, new uh, bearing pads to new technology underneath the bridge deck uh, to redeck the bridge to restore uh, surface friction for traffic that's that's crossing um, to uh, to do other work to widen the bridge to help accommodate not just today's traffic but also into the future. Uh, so that was uh, the, the totality of, of some of the work that we had planned to not only just widen the road but also in, improve the bridge. Do Anything you know else? How far back though that that was planned? I know you guys plan projects like decade. Like a decade in advance. Do you know how long sure. ago knew about this bridge having problems? So we began developing this project before we had funding identified. 
Uh, that funding came about uh, during the 2014 legislative session. Um, based upon some general state funds that are available to us on top of the, the normal fuel taxes and, and other transportation fees that are dedicated to uh, construction and maintenance of highways. Can the commissioner talk about any kind of timeline whatsoever? Uh, obviously people want to know how quickly this is going to reopen. We're we talking days, weeks, months, what are we looking at? Yeah. So as we're early in the um, evaluation process and the analysis of the geotechnical data, we would hesitate to give any kind of timeline at this time. Um, really, probably will be um, later in the week before we um, really get our arms around um, some of the more viable solutions. And is there so, a so, so should people be ready for preparing for these detours to take some time and for this to be for the foreseeable future? I think foreseeable future is a good um, is a good estimate. <laughs> if someone was not, if the contractors were not in that area at this time, what could have happened to this bridge? Um, you know, are we lucky that these contractors were in this area at this time to see that there was this movement happening? So, um, uh, to, to answer that question, uh, they were. They were in the area because they were working on, on the bridge. So, um, you know, we expect that there's a combination of factors that will be uh, what caused uh, the settlement in the piers. Um, the construction is one of those factors, in addition to just the original construction of the bridge and the unique soil features that are in that area. There's underground water in this area that uh, the, the contractors identified that has, has, you know, helped create some of these issues. So we're trying to exactly understand how each of these contributed. Um, and, and, and as a result, then from there, determine what the repair plan is. Um, so that's that's something we're still working through at this point. But uh, the the construction is is what we were doing to help improve the bridge. But it's also what you know brought about the uh, uh, the situation that we're in today. Well, is something about the land, the character of the land changed. I mean, obviously, you were building it over water, and we knew there was water there when the bridge was built. Has the has the land or the soil changed over time? Is that what? Being so there's an artesian feature underneath uh, the, the creek in that area um, where the, the piers are, are located in the riverbank. Uh, so the contractors encountered this artesian feature, which is basically water under pressure underground. Um, and that's uh, what they encountered as they were uh, widening the bridge as part of the, the plan construction. And so uh, when they encountered that, that sort of changed the soil composition in the area. And we're trying to learn more about exactly how that all contributed. So I'm guessing the initial survey of the land way back when didn't notice that that was there? Um, I don't have the information about the initial survey way back when. But um, you know, it, there were, uh, I, I mentioned earlier, the original construction from 1968 of the bridges. Um, and, and the issue there, um, you know, they uh, encountered challenges when they were building this project originally. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're, we did some analysis before we um, bid the project to, um, to determine, you know, what, what we needed to do in terms of rehabilitating that. Is it possible that, that? This, uh, that this settling could have caused the rocker bearings to fall up the last time this, this bridge had to be closed? And also, um, are you guys looking at the southbound lanes as well? They're both over water, so. Okay, good question. Um, the, uh, the, the settling, uh, we're, we're doing a more in-depth analysis today as a result of the settlement that was observed on Friday. Uh, and that may help us not only learn what happened on Friday, but also more about what happened on Tuesday. So I would say stay tuned. Um, that, that will give us more information that then we can you know, use to better understand all the factors that are at play. Um, with regard to the southbound, um, there are, we have not observed the same sort of issues at that location, but we are monitoring. We mentioned the, uh, uh, the real-time monitoring uh, devices. We're planning uh, to, to monitor the bridges. And, and just for, for reference, if, if anyone was familiar with uh, the South Split project uh, that occurred in Indianapolis in 2013, we had real-time monitoring on that bridge. That was the source of some of the video of, of trucks hitting some of the low bridges there. Um, we partner with the folks here at Purdue to um, provide real-time monitoring that can give us text message alerts, that can uh, give us or email alerts, real-time data that we can then use to, to rush uh, bridge inspectors to the scene um, or to, again, just to con continue to monitor. When it comes to these detours, how about local traffic? Why can't someone who lives off 26 travel from Indianapolis and get off at that 26 exit? Why such a long part that is closed? Sure. So um, 
I'll reference the South Split Project again. Uh, similar situation. We closed I-65 and I-70 in downtown Indianapolis for a planned construction project. Um, we had signs and detours. It was planned in advance, and we still had a problem with trucks, uh, particularly taking the, the highway as far as it would go, um, and, and then trying to navigate on the city streets. So we've been working with our partners in law enforcement and the local communities to um, try to identify the best routes. The current detour um, maximizes four-lane roads in the area, minimizes traffic signals, avoids construction. Um, we, we looked at a lot of factors, um, and travel time being one of them. Um, but if you want to use an, another route, um, uh, we'd recommend looking further out. Uh, you could take I-74 to State Road 63, take that north to US 41 and then US 24 back to I-65. Or you could take I-74 all the way into Illinois to Interstate 57. That'll keep you on the interstate system if you're heading north towards Chicago. So uh, there are some other options, but uh, it, it's very difficult to filter the local from the truck traffic. Um, when you have truck traffic, going over roads that aren't designed for it. You have issues with weight. You have issues with intersections and uh, providing the proper turn radius for those trucks that are trying to navigate. Um, we also don't want to gridlock uh, uh, the city of Lafayette or West Lafayette, so we're trying to identify those routes that are the best. Are you also going to then, you're basically saying that the local traffic detour is going to stay the way it is. There won't be anything else that will help Lafayette specifically? Uh, with regard to traffic, we're continually monitoring. So we put in the, 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 the traffic signals over the weekend to try to help deal with some of the backups that we saw on the detour. Um, we purchased real-time monitoring, again, through our partnership with Purdue. And um, the, uh, if we observe issues or opportunities to try to, um, uh, to try to help improve traffic, not just for through, but also for local, um, it's, a, it's a delicate balancing act. And um, in addition, uh, we're also aware of those major events that are coming up. In about a week, you have move-in day for Purdue. So we're trying to manage through not only the recurring weekend and day-to-day uh, -day traffic for commuters, but also um, those special events that are coming. So we're, we're, we're looking at options. And so uh, the detour at this current time, the way it is, will stand. I wouldn't rule out the possibility that we make an adjustment based upon what we're seeing. And a clarification question on Mm -hmm. When you are traveling on the detour on US 52 and you have to turn onto State Road 28, is 52 closed right there at 28? Or if you know it's easier for someone to go straight on 52 who may live locally, can you do that? Right. So that's the preferred detour for someone who is going to Lafayette is to stay straight on State Road 52. The signs say local traffic only. Um, otherwise, the, the, the big arrow boards and uh, the, the signs and the signals are encouraging traffic there to turn left. So uh, that's, uh, again, an important part of, of keeping the, uh, uh, the, the truck traffic on those uh, state highways um, that are designed for that type of traffic. What about the lights that are at that intersection? Mm -hmm. uh, that one and also 231 and 28, I believe, is, uh, are those going to stay there throughout this closure? Uh, yes, um, unless we make some type of adjustment like I mentioned before. Um, I, thank you for bringing that up because I did want to take a moment to thank uh, Duke Power uh, and Indiana 811. Uh, they worked through the weekend to help us get those signals up and those have had a pretty significant effect on improving traffic on the detour. So um, in addition to our own crews, our partners uh, were, were able to, to help us out uh, to do that over, over the weekend. Any sense of how much this is all costing? Because now you're doing extra testing, you're doing <laughs> signals, you're working, you're buying stuff from Purdue. We don't have no number yet, do we? It has to, it has to be adding on. Um, that's not our primary concern at this point. I mean, obviously, yeah, uh, with, taxpayers. with taxpayer dollars, we have that concern. Um, that's something we're going to work to resolve. But I mean, our top priority is the safety of the public and getting the interstate open as quickly as possible. So, um, you know, expenses is less of a concern than safety than um, mobility and, and minimizing the impacts to everybody that are involved. So well, I, you know, I have to say that we're concerned about cost on time on budget as our big uh, driving goal for everything that we do. Um, the, uh, uh, we're working with the contractors to, to identify this in a reasonable way and in a reasonable cost. Is there a, com is there a comparable case like this in the end that you had to deal with and would that help for the timeline at all? Um, with the timeline, no. Every bridge is unique. Every situation is unique. This is this is a really a unique combination of original construction, the the soil conditions, um, you know, and and the fact that construction was in this area. But we have closed interstates before. Um, I mentioned the South Split that was precipitated by a unplanned closure of I-65 northbound and I-70 eastbound. 
Um, we closed the I-64 Sherman Minton Bridge over the Ohio River into Louisville in 2011. Um, so when we have concerns about the, the safety of a structure uh, for the motoring public, we do not hesitate to, to take action and ensure safety and then uh, put all the resources that we have available to us to try to get it open as quickly as possible. Who's the contractor for this and have they been cleared of any sort of blame or wrongdoing <laughs> in this? Um, so the contractor, uh, we awarded the uh, contractor in January is Walsh Construction Company. They're widening I-65 from uh, State Road 38 to State Road 25 here in the Lafayette area. Um, and we're still assessing exactly what happened. So um, that would be part of that is, is to understand what factors contributed. So is it possible that they might have to pay for some of this? Um, I, I mean, really anything's possible at this point, but, uh, um, but we haven't completed our analysis. How has this changed how you're looking at all the other bridges that you monitor? Um, anytime we have an incident like this, it's an opportunity for us to learn new things that we can apply to the rest of our system. Again, this is a unique combination of factors, so um, it may require a similar unique combination somewhere else to, to be able to apply what we've learned. Um, but you know, certainly this, is, this will be an opportunity for us to, as this all concludes, learn from it and apply it elsewhere in our system. Will we see more of this real-time monitoring you're installing here? Uh, the public can access, uh, well, uh, in terms of real-time monitoring, um, we've, we've been using that for a variety of different factors. Monitoring temperature, when that affects the, uh, the, the brittleness, if you will, of the steel. Uh, monitoring vibration when a truck hits, an oversized vehicle hits the, uh, hits the bridge, and we need to know about that. Um, so there are modular um, sensors that we can connect to a cellular network for real-time notification. Um, it's kind of like a smartphone that has a camera and a vibration sensor and all those things. It's just it's geared towards a bridge. Um, uh, so that's uh, uh, what we've been uh, pioneering with, with Purdue. And uh, yeah, we've, we've used it in the public, seen some of the examples of, of where we've been able to use this technology. Are you expanding its use, though? I um, uh, don't know that off the top of my head. I have to look into that. And has this led to the inspection of other bridges, though? Um, we inspect every bridge on a routine basis every two years. Um, in terms of additional inspections, our, our focus is on this bridge um, and the sort of unique factors that are at play here. Um, but again, if we learn something that help us improve our inspection techniques, um, there are some new inspection standards that the Federal Highway Administration's put into place these past few years. Um, that require an increased level of inspection. So we've been transitioning our, our county partners who inspect the local bridges to uh, look for these specific things that the Federal Highway Administration is looking for. And we've got Federal Highway Administration here with us today. Um, so that's, uh, that's something that uh, we've placed increased focus on inspection, but also on maintenance and repairing our existing uh, bridges uh, by sort of diverting our and shifting our, our resources towards, uh, towards rehabilitation and repair. People are tweeting back at me as I tweet out kind of what you're saying and one of the perceptions that's out there is that the the um, fixing this bridge was delayed because of funding um, can you address that I know you said that 2014 you guys secured the funds in order to fix it but how long did you know about this bridge's condition and can you address the perception that this was a result of delays in funding well uh, again the construction is what brought about what we're in today. So um, by that, if the construction began earlier, we may have been seeing this earlier as well. Um, so I don't know if that necessarily would, would have an impact. Um, I, I will tell you that we are shifting, as I mentioned before, all of our resources to our traditional funding to maintaining and preserving our existing roads and bridges. That's our focus. Um, it's been a change in, in perspective. Um, and that's what the engineering tells us is absolutely necessary. When we survey the public, that's what they tell us they want. Um, but that also means that we're working more in areas where traffic is existing on the old infrastructure while we build the new. So uh, that's going to be something that the public is going to increasingly see is us working on existing roads and bridges and, and impacting that existing traffic. Are the northbound and the southbound bridges built the same um, in that area? Every bridge is unique. Um, but I'm saying, why wouldn't these issues not happen on the southbound bridges? I'm trying to understand. You wanted, um, somebody wanted to address that? Yeah. Um, I'm Ann Rurick, I'm the Director of Bridges. Um, the soil conditions may be slightly different at the southbound where they may not have hit the artesian condition, so which would not potentially cause the settlement. Um, the structures are, um, I think they're twin structures, so they're identical structures. They're just, the soils can change very quickly in a short distance. So that would be why you may not see the problem. 
and we are closely monitoring um, the southbound structure to ensure that it's not moving at all. How many spans are there, and then what kind of bridges? Is this, you know, is this standard? There, is this bridge used all across the state? What it's a very standard design. Um, it's a five-span continuous steel beam. And when it was reconstructed in, what, 1988, what work was done then? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm not sure, Jeremy, do you know? I believe it was overlay, uh, bridge deck overlay at that time. It was, a, it was a bridge deck overlay. I think the question that I have is, I mean, the piers were noticed rotating, and, and Will, you've referenced that maybe the initial construction combined with other factors were part of this. What was run into in the original construction? Was there a soil problem then? Did they run into this artesian water source? We're still going through the records to try to determine what happened during the initial construction. In which pier is it? It's pier three. Did you point it out, Jeremy? So, yeah. So it's kind of in the middle of the channel? It's on the kind of the edge of the channel. Jeremy, is this bridge, is this picture looking north or south? I assume it's looking north. 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 Jeremy, which one was it? It's the pier on the south side of the channel. So it's the riverbank pier. It's not actually in the water, but it's on the riverbank uh, on the south side of Wildcat Creek. At, at the risk of asking a question with a really obvious answer, are you worried about, that, <laughs> at, about the bridge collapsing? Or are you worried about the, the middle pier collapsing? What's the fear that you have? We're concerned with the settlement of the pier and the stability of it. We want to stabilize the pier. Um, if it continues to settle, it'll have different forces on the bridge and, and how we would be able to support it. So there is long-term stability is something that we are closely monitoring and researching. Yeah, and I don't know if you'd want to speculate exactly what would happen. I mean, mm -hmm. um, we have not, have we observed any settlement since we closed the, the bridge? I've not been informed of any settlement since we took traffic off the bridge. I mean, my guess if you're closing it, you're worried it's going to, it could collapse or that it's, fall or I think we're worried more that you would get more of a significant dip in the bridge, not that it would collapse, but that it would, you know, cause the bridge not to be rideable. Yeah, we want to we want to avoid uh, long-term damage to the bridge, which mm -hmm. gives us the option to reopen it. Um, this bridge is not fracture critical; um, it has mm -hmm. redundancy built in uh, the the deck itself. Uh, so uh, that's different than some of our larger bridges, which pass over major waterways. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that all the rain ha caused some of this problem? That is something that we're looking into to see if it was a contributing factor. Did you learn anything from the, the temporary fix that didn't seem to work? Is there anything you can take forward from that to future bridge issues to say, well, clearly we've learned that this doesn't work in this scenario? I wouldn't say that we learned that it didn't work. I think we've, we've take, we would apply any lessons learned to all our future projects. Well, you had to reclose the bridge. We did, but I wouldn't say that the fix was the inappropriate fix. The, the construction issues may have contributed to what caused the second closure. The, you know, what was going on timeline would have contributed to settlement. So are you saying that those three days, whatever Walsh did between Tuesday or Wednesday and Friday might have been the, the big contributing factor to reclosing, reclosing the bridge? The construction, the timeline of all the construction operations could be a contributing factor, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, what, what I would say about that is that we we uh, had the, the issue with the, the bearings falling out on, on Tuesday um, when we uh, the. Uh, uh, the time we closed the bridge on Friday, there had been substantial settlement. And we anticipate that's because if these artesian conditions were encountered, um, it, it drains water from underneath that, that layer under the bridge. And so that it's, it's a constant process. And, and so, so it would just continue to, to settle. And so that's, that's what we are speculating at this time. But what is uh, substantial settlement? Like feet, inches? Inches. Inches. Like yes. Five inches? Uh, uh, we, we, I don't know if we're entirely certain on that. I so mean, so we, we were told, uh, I believe, nine inches is the number that uh, Walsh had measured on Friday when they arrived on site. Like from the day they started or from when they reopened? 
Uh, I believe when they reopened it, yes. What sorts of work was going on in those three days? They were uh, working on an adjacent substructure, so Pier 2, um, that you can see uh, on, on this side of, of the river. Uh, they were working there, uh, uh, building, tying up, reinforcing. It was, it's not substantial work. Uh, there, was, there was some, uh, as I understand it, some dewatering of, of the, the coffer dam uh, in between the two piers that was taking place. So, so removing water out of that coffer dam. Uh, and and I, that's most of the work that I'm aware of. And it was about two days. You say the bridges are the, the new thing you want to, that the state's concentrating on. How many bridges are there in this rated um, condition? Four or less, I think was the number I saw. And if you were to put all the state's money into those, how many years are we talking about to fix all those? Um, let's see. So uh, bridges age. Uh, they're not constant. Um, they don't age quickly, but they do age. Um, and uh, the, uh, currently, we have, uh, of our 5,600 bridges uh, that NDOT maintains, um, about 6.4% have one or more elements that are in poor condition. Um, I mentioned we're shifting all of our traditional resources to uh, maintaining pavement and bridges. Uh, both are important. Um, that means about $274 million each year for bridge repair and maintenance. It's time for that. Um, the, uh, uh, and, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, so that means that um, over 10 years at that level of investment, uh, we do expect uh, the condition of, uh, of bridges to decline by double. Um, we expect to have about 12% in poor condition. So that's part of the conversation that NDOT uh, and our local partners are having with the legislature about what is the appropriate level of funding for transportation across the state um, and what, uh, what the public expects in terms of bridge and pavement condition. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, that's, a, that's a serious discussion that I think this is bringing to light. Is this, when you say that you're talking with the lawmakers, are you talking about is this a state question or is it a federal question or is it a big combination? We've been the most effective at addressing these issues at the state level. Um, federal funding is, has stayed constant uh, over the past several years due to a number of short-term extensions. Um, right now, um, the state is investing more in, in roads and bridges than uh, we're taking in with federal fuel, with, with fuel taxes and with other dedicated fees. Um, we're studying long-term ways to find additional funding for uh, transportation in a way that, that makes sense that uh, has the people who are, are using these facilities uh, helping to, to pay for their upkeep and maintenance. Have you guys considered any temporary solutions such as a crossover lane or something that could reopen that section of the interstate at least one lane? Really good question. Thanks for asking. Um, so right now, uh, southbound traffic is reduced to 11-foot lanes. Normally it's 12. Um, if we were to uh, cross southbound traffic over, reduce traffic to one lane in each direction, uh, there's not really room for a typical barrier that you would put in between. So that means we would need to reduce I-65 to 35 miles an hour um, and put them into a very narrow space for trucks and some of those other large vehicles that go through. Uh, based upon just the nighttime closures that we've had and some of the periodic daytime lane closures, that's going to significantly impact traffic in both directions. So um, that is not the ideal solution. We're, we're looking at if there are other potential solutions but we've, we've already considered that one and determined it's probably not going to um, help southbound traffic um, and, and it would probably be you know, similar delays for northbound traffic. As this pier is settling, in one of the old reports it said it was rotating. Can you tell me, is it just settling? Is it rotating one way or another? Uh, when we talk about rotating, it's rotating kind of on a... Uh, Tilting. Vertical axis is tilting is probably the best, you know. So it, one. Right. So it's not actually <laughs> rotating in place. It's rotating. It's tilting, basically. So vertically, it's leaning right. down. Right. One side, of the, of one side of the pier is settling more than the other. How much? And so then how does that, okay, so the rocker bearings were initially, it seemed like that was the problem because those, that's what out and then it went to this pier. So how do all these components come together? Are we finding <laughs> <laughs> basic, you want to give a basic explanation of soil to... Uh, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, so 
So, with, and, and as Will has, has mentioned, there, there's very unique uh, soils conditions on this site. So, so the foundation sits on, on a, a very stiff layer of soil. That stiff layer of soil is on top of what we believe to be these, these loose sands, these, these artesian conditions where there's, there's flowing water down there. Uh, the existing substructure is on, on what we call spread footings where it's just a footing sitting on top of that, that stiff layer of, of soil. And then working your way up from there, then we have what we call the pier stem uh, extending up and then the, the bearings, the rocker bearings uh, sit on top of that, that pier stem. Now the rockers are, they have curved surfaces on both sides that allows them to uh, move back and forth, rock essentially, which is how the, the bridge is allowed to relieve any uh, forces that would be caused by expansion and contraction uh, due to temperature. So, so the rocker bearings are, are designed to allow the bridge to move back and forth. I was, I was thinking the rocker bearings took the cushion of the impact of traffic moving, but does it help it with the longitudinal length expansion and how? It's it it's actually more for the longitudinal. Yes, they're actually they're, they're steel, they're, they're solid steel pedestals, um, so so they don't really have any um, any compressive nature to them. Uh, they're very stiff, but they do allow um, the the bridge to move longitudinally due to those curved surfaces and to expand and contract. So as this thing goes this way, is that why those rocker bearings fell out? Do you believe you know? I, I, I would speculate that, that, that that's possible. Yeah, and, it, and the, uh, the pile driving operation began on Monday night. Um, and so on Tuesday, th there probably would have been very little settlement, I would speculate, at that point. But it, um, apparently, might have been enough to allow those those rockers to to fall out of position. Is it reasonable to believe that over time some amount of settlement is just expected, just not nine inches in two or three days? Right. That's uh, so. So we actually have uh, very stringent requirements in our specifications um, in terms of the subsurface preparation. So anytime we would we would use a, a, this type of foundation, uh, we would require the contractor to prepare the. The, the subsurface um, very adequately so that we would not anticipate um, settlement or if we did we would we would construct it in a way that um, we eliminated the settlement before we we uh, opened the bridge to traffic um, so this this is just kind of a very unique circumstance so you're opening for zero settlement when you build a bridge a absolutely by the by the time it's open to traffic yes <laughs> so is it really the soil or is it more of this Kind of moving the gravel on your knee. What kind of soil is that? So, so it, I, um, you know, I'm not a geotechnical engineer, so, so, but, but we're speculating at this time that it's kind of a, a combination of the two. That, um, as I think Will alluded to it, that these artesian features, it's, it's a water feature under this very dense, very firm layer of material. It's, it's under high pressure. Actually, it's, it's, it's like drilling a well. You have this water that's, that's pressurized underneath this layer. And so um, this, this sits down in a deep ravine you can see in the pictures. And so the groundwater uh, adjacent to the site is, is probably very high. And so that actually pressurizes that water underneath. And, and so if there's an opportunity for it to escape, then that's, that's, that's where the, the water pressure comes from and, and what um, one potential Thing that can lead to lead to settlement. We're all going to get education in structural engineering here. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I'm starting to hear the questions trail off. Um, as I mentioned, uh, since we do not have um, a, a action plan for um, uh, addressing the settlement for reopening the bridge at this time. Um, our plan is to come back and continue to provide updates. So um, we want to keep the public informed uh, at every step of the way. Uh, as we know, new information. Uh, we've been providing regular updates on all the different mediums available to us, and um, we do thank you for helping to keep the public informed on all this. So uh, I think at this point we'll conclude things. So thank you.